My name is Don Hobbs, and I'm the co-founder of MAPS Business Training here in Austin, Texas. I'm partnered with Gary Keller of Keller Williams Real Estate. I'm building a training company, and I was asked, uh, and I'm honored to be able to do this because I wanted to introduce my good friend who's actually doing this panel. Uh, her name is Shelly Delane. Shelly. Shelly, exactly. So Shelly and I got a chance to meet a couple years ago. She has a little company called the Orange Co-working Space. She's one of the uh, great leaders of, in the co-working industry here. Of course, we've got so many uh, uh, great players, but I love how she has uh, put her whole heart and soul into this organization called Or Orange. And I have had a chance to work with many of her uh, entrepreneurs at her, at her co-working space. And I think she does an amazing job. And I'm honored and so pleased to bring her to the stage. Come on up, Shelly. Delane, everybody. <laughs> He's handing me the mic. I like it. Thank you so much, Don. And I will tell you, yeah, going through the MAPS business training was a really transformative experience for me as an entrepreneur. So I appreciate the intro, Don, very much. All right. I am going to... Oh, we've got mics on all the chairs. going to set down my water so that I can actually say hello. And if I could bring up my panelists now, we'll all do this as a group because... We are here to talk about co-working today, and co-working involves a lot of people doing things in a collaborative way, so I would like to welcome to the stage, and I will allow them to introduce themselves also, but David and Dean and Lorenzo, if you guys want to find a place to sit. I'm going to use this one so I can be untethered. Okay, so I think first, I'd like to get to know a little bit more about who's here. Could I get a show of hands? Um, how many of y'all own businesses? How many of you are actually, oh, I love it. Small Business Festival rocks. This is great. Seriously? <laughs> when else do we get to get together with other business owners? Oh, wait, at co-working spaces. But outside of that... This is an amazing festival. So how many of you have ever been to a co-working space? Did you go to any of the community events this week? Cool, okay, so some. How many of you are members of a co-working space presently? Cool, awesome, okay, so there's some familiarity in the room, I love it. Um, I'd also like to, right now, give a shout out to the co-working spaces around the country that are streaming this right now. Hi, guys! I know we've got, um, Common Desk up in Dallas, and I believe we've got uh, Indie Hall in Philadelphia, one of the original co-working spaces. I think we've got um, one up in Portland. We've got a few. I will look at my notes so we can give them specific shout-outs. But now I would love it if y'all would introduce yourselves, and I'm going to take a seat. And if you could, just for right now, name and what company you are presently with, and what is your place in the co-working universe? Like, what do you, what, what's your experience with co-working? Hello, uh, my name is David, uh, David Walker. I'm with a company called The Open Work Agency. Uh, and so before I started Open Work, I started the first co-working space in Austin called uh, Conjunctured in 2007. I operated it until uh, 2014 and then started a co-working consultancy where me and some other people help other people open co-working spaces. And so the trick has been maintaining that original ethos of co-working as the industry evolves. There's 11,000 spaces in the world now, and so there's a, lot, there's a lot of activity out there. Hello, I'm Dean Syracuse. I'm president and founder of Summerhawk Optics and Flying Eyes Sunglasses. Um, I uh, work at, a, at Orange Co-working. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lorenzo Gomez, and um, I run the largest co-working space in San Antonio. It's a co-working space called Geekdom. And I also run um, uh, a, f a private foundation called the 8020 Foundation. And uh, the mission of both the foundation and Geekdom is to create an ecosystem in downtown San Antonio where the next uh, tech scene can be born. And so our, our role, our co-working role in the city of San Antonio is to really kind of be the epicenter for uh, tech entrepreneurs to really get their start. I love it. Thanks, guys. And you'll notice, if you look at the slide, we do have someone who is not here with us today because she went to the co-working conference in New York. Um, 
but that's good because she's carrying Austin love there. Um, first, I'd actually love to talk to Dean because he's a serial entrepreneur. You know the type, right? I'm imagining there's some here. Um, and one of the things that has been cool for me, I, since I have Orange Coworking down in way south Austin, and we've been around for two years now, and one of the things that's always fun for me is seeing how our members grow and change and what happens in their company just because they're in a co-working environment. Um, and Dean is kind of my poster child because his company has grown quite a lot in the last couple of years. And I think we should talk about it. So, how many employees do you have right now in your company? And what was that? <laughs> okay, we're good. Nothing's falling. Um, no, to backtrack, how old is your company? Uh, the company started in 2013. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, I patented eyewear that is comfortable under a headset or helmet. I'm a pilot, fly airplanes, and uh, regular glasses always bug me. And so um, I set about to solve the problem. And uh, like I said, we launched the company and with one single frame style. And <clears throat> now we have uh, seven frame styles. And, and, and selling our glasses beyond just the aviation community, we sell to motorcycle dealerships, motorcycle, the motorcycle world, uh, firefighters, EMT, first responders world, and uh, selling to motorsports and other areas as well. Super cool, and they are really comfortable sunglasses. Um, my biggest problem is I lose mine because I forget they're already on my head. <laughs> Whatever. Um, so I know for me, as a relatively new entrepreneur, I've always been self-employed. I was a freelance graphic designer before I opened Orange, but I'm fairly new at having a company and working with other people and hiring people. And one of the things that I've learned from you is how to grow a company without bringing on full-time employees necessarily. And I'd love it if you could talk about, like, has co-working influenced that for you? And how's that, how has that been, finding people to collaborate with and work with? Yeah, I can easily speak to that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we don't actually, well, I'm, I'm the only employee, officially. Um, we have a ton of freelance people that work for me. Um, and I couldn't have found most of them without Orange Coworking. Um, we have... Um, well, we have a fulfillment company which is outside of uh, of our uh, of our business, um, but I have I hired uh, bookkeepers, uh, uh, personal assistants, business uh, tech support, customer support service, um, uh, CPAs. Um, oh gosh, what's that? Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. And actually, um, uh, cr creative, creative design, uh, uh, product guides, uh, you know, uh, Well, I design. know yes. when you first came to Orange, one of the things you were looking for was um, a 3D product designer yes. to... Yes, that's right. So um, we, had, uh, we had one frame style, and, and it was very successful. But one frame style isn't an eyewear company. It doesn't solve. It does. It doesn't. They don't look good on everybody. So I uh, made the point to to create uh, a bunch of other frame styles. But uh, you know, hiring an engineer is one thing. But hiring a designer that is familiar with the eyewear industry and actually designing eyewear is kind of hard to find. How do you find that kind of a designer? Well, um, that when I finally made up my mind to do that, uh, I was. Just talking to Shelly about, you know, I'm, I need to find a, an, an eyewear designer, but I'm not sure how to find that kind of a person. I even belong to uh, uh, eyewear industry organizations, and it was kind of uh, hard to find that kind of a person. And Shelly said, well, you know, there's a, there's a 3D designer that just joined last week. Um, why don't you go talk to him? And uh, I did. And turns out he's done work for uh, major eyewear companies. Um, and I said, wow, great. And he's very talented. Um, and so he, he designed uh, our latest, uh, our most recent frame styles and couldn't have done it without Orange. Awesome. I love that one because that was such a nice moment of synchronicity. And synchronicity is something co-working spaces everywhere do really well. Happens amazing, all the time. Yeah, amazing things happen when you get 
entrepreneurs together in space. Like, that's part of the reason why events like this are fun, because you meet people and you go, oh, you're doing this, I'm doing this. They fit together. Awesome. Um, so I will say David Walker is one of the people that was kind to me as I was looking to start Orange Coworking and gave me the benefit of his wisdom in the coworking world. And David's been a part of the coworking world since kind of the idea of coworking was invented. Um, as we've moved towards work that we can do from anywhere, uh, coworking has really filled that place for entrepreneurs of how to work together in space and not be isolated in our houses or trying desperately to not freeze and fighting with the Wi-Fi at, I don't know, coffee shops. Um, so David, I would love to get an overview from you of your coworking journey from conjunctured to having a bigger perspective on the, on the co-working world. Like, you've kind of got the overview. Um, so, so, yeah, so co-working, it, it's, a really, it's a really special kind of industry um, because there aren't a lot of industries that um, are focused on bringing people together and making things happen when they're together. And so in the beginning, when I started Conjunctured, it was in an old house on the east side at 7th and Navasota, small place, 1,600 square feet, and it was more of a friendship place. And people came, they paid a membership, we had rent to pay, we, we had expenses, but at the end of the day, people were there to network, but more build friendships. And then over time, co-working has matured a little bit, and uh, it's... it's, um, it's it's still about friendship, but people are very learning, they're, they're learning to leverage, like Dean says, about hiring people, about growing their companies, about collaborating with people in very effective ways. Um, and that's kind of what has allowed co-working to evolve a lot. Um, nowadays, fast forward 11 years after the beginning of co-working, which was invented in 2006 uh, from, uh, uh, the, in San Francisco, and um, now hotels are experimenting with co-working, airports, train stations, cities, libraries, large companies, all these things. And, and they get into it for a variety of reasons. Um, one, because it's now a pragmatic choice for a new office, but another because it, it's a phenomenal model for allowing people to connect with each other in a world which is so inundated with noise, where it's so hard to, you know, you're on Facebook or Twitter and you can tweet at someone or you can Facebook someone, but at the end of the day, you're not co-present. And co-presence is the magic of co-working. And without that co-presence, there's not gonna be those serendipitous moments because when you're with someone, you actually, you wanna do something to take it to that next level. And so that's, I think, why co-working has changed a lot and grown a lot. Conjunctured started in 1,500 square feet, and now people, uh, I'm helping consult on projects that are 30, 40,000 square feet, or entire cities that are looking to do it. And it, it's, it's, really, it's really becoming the new office, not just because it's aspirational, but nowadays because it's pragmatic. There's no more need for a small business owner or a freelancer to lease a five-year lease at some executive suite pay a ridiculous amount of deposit. You just join a co-working space month to month. You leave whenever you want. You stay as long as you want and you meet people every day. And it's the jobs of people like Shelly and other co-working space owners and managers to connect you to people. And so you get this benefit of having someone on your team. And it's a wonderful experience for anyone that hasn't experienced it. I would venture to say that it is becoming the new, met, the new mode of work um, for even large companies. And so Austin is a really special place. We're actually the most densely packed co-working capital in the world. I think we have, what's the last count number of spaces? 52. 52 spaces. Um, for reference, another large city, San Antonio. How many co-working spaces are in San Antonio? Probably five. Five. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's because there's a special thing about Austin and the small business energy here and the freelance energy here and, the, um, and people wanting to support local. And so you have a real special opportunity here in Austin to really get the true taste of co-working. I totally agree with that. And, for, and also for frame of reference, if you haven't heard about co-working, 
don't feel bad. Two years ago, when Orange opened, there were 14 spaces in town. So there's been a tremendous growth over the last couple of years. So there's likely one in a neighborhood near you now. Um, so talking about different cities and different sizes of co-working spaces, I want to bring Lorenzo into the discussion. Um, Lorenzo has come up from San Antonio, and I met Lorenzo a few months ago, but I've been aware of geekdom since the beginning of my journey, and I've always been curious about what it is they're doing down there. And um, actually, rather than giving my impressions of what they're doing down there, why don't you tell us about geekdom and sort of the origin and growth of geekdom and why, why geekdom exists? Yeah, uh, where do we start? I think, um, you know, I always start with brand, the brand of San Antonio, and I think that if I were to poll any one of you and say, uh, what do you know about San Antonio? You'd probably say the Alamo. And I'm here to tell you that if you go to the Alamo, your first thought's going to be, I thought it'd be bigger than that. <laughs> and I think the other thing that we're known for is the Riverwalk. And I'm also here to tell you that no local goes to the Riverwalk unless my aunt's visiting from Missouri and I have to take her down there. And so I think that our brand is really uh, not about entrepreneurship. Our brand is not tech. And so uh, Geekdom was formed so that we could create a new narrative for our city and, uh, and so um, our owner, Graham, and I, and the other co-founder, um, Nick Longo, I'm not a co-founder, um, I'm, the, I'm the CEO, um, we went to study many cities that were really trying to revitalize and kickstart their tech economy. And so Geekdom became the most important tactic that our owner deployed in order to do it. And you know, I'll just reference a couple places that we studied. Um, one of them was Las Vegas. Uh, Tony Shea and, and the Zappos Downtown Project, they have some really amazing work. Um, that they've done, and he has this phrase about serendipitous collisions, and I truly believe it. I think that um, the, when, when co-working is done well, you have the collision of ideas happening all around you, and I think it is the collision of ideas where companies are born. And um, there's a really great book that we read on this journey uh, by a Harvard professor named Ed Glacier, and he wrote a book called Triumph of the City. And he talked about how you know cities are really the greatest invention of, of humankind, and it's because these are the dense nodes where people go to meet other people. And I believe that in the new world, when most cities are sprawled, you can go to a city for opportunity, but you go to the co-working spaces to actually meet and get connected in a real big metropolis. So that was really the foundation and the ethos that Geekdom was born. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, the theme of my career is being wrong. And when, when Geekdom started, I thought, this is a terrible idea, and no one's ever going to show up. And I've just been so blown away about the response in San Antonio, because you just think, you, don't, you know, you just don't think San Antonio is tech. And when we opened the doors, people just started coming, and they haven't stopped. And so we have over 1,500 members today. Uh, we have over 500 companies associated that either office there full-time or have an employee working there. And it's really just uh, blown me away, the response. And I think every city needs to be doing uh, something like that or have a place where, where entrepreneurs can meet. I describe it to my mother as the YMCA for geeks and as the, <laughs> kind of the only way I can get her to understand what I do. Uh, but that's kind of geekdom story. So can, can we actually like have members actually do the YMCA Yeah, absolutely. Dance? Yeah, okay. yeah. You wouldn't want to see that video though. Yeah, no. That would be entertaining. The same way the mu history museums every year do the museum dance-off videos, we could totally do a co-working one to the YMCA. I'm in. Okay, I like it. Um, and I'm actually curious, because I know that when Geekdom started, there wasn't all that much happening in the San Antonio startup world. And I'm curious, because a lot of the folks at, at Orange and at a lot of the co-working spaces I know, people come with their idea in mind. Like they've got a business already started or they're working on starting a thing and they're looking for support around that. But I'm curious about things that have sprung from members at Geekdom just from being in the space together. Have you had any new companies form or new collaborations or partnerships? Or Oh yeah. Uh, this is probably the most inspiring part of co-working is uh, when you see, when you see a, a serendipitous collision happen and then a company's born. And uh, I'll tell you a couple of stories. When we first opened, uh, we had a limited number of offices and the way that we mandated our, our setup was everybody had to share an office. And so if you were a startup of two people and you wanted to be an office, we would put two or three people from different companies in one office together. And one of the greatest success stories was there was two guys that were officing together that had never met before and they started complaining about the lack of programmers in San Antonio. And so from that, you know, 
complaining session, they formed a boot camp called Code Up, and they asked if they could, you know, use our open space to teach these classes. And, uh, and so Code Up was born, and it is one of the largest boot camps in San Antonio. And uh, they just got uh, approved for the GI Bill, so if you are a former veteran, you can use GI Bill to go to their coding boot camp. Uh, it's one of the first ones in the, in the country that's done it. And so they grew so quickly that they outgrew our space, and they occupy about 10,000 square feet in an adjacent building, and they're actually looking for more space. Uh, so that was one idea. I think another idea is a really cool company called Merge Virtual Reality. And uh, they have uh, a very affordable $60, $70 virtual reality headset that uses your phone. And this year they were voted um, uh, most interesting product at CES. And the way that interaction happened was the, the founder was from San Antonio and he had worked for a big gaming company. And he had built this, this headset out of you know foam and duct tape. And I remember he came to geek them with this prototype, and I put it on. I said, dude, this is really cool. And then once again, I said, ah, oh, this will never go anywhere. And terrible idea, right? And so, uh, so don't ever pick me for as an investor. Uh, and so, you know, he joined Geekdom looking for a co-founder. He was introduced to a guy uh, who was also running a, a clean technology incubator for the University of Texas San Antonio who had been itching to get back in the in the in the real, the entrepreneur world. And so they formed this company, um, they got some really great investment and they're growing like crazy. They've, they're in GameStop, Best Buy, Target, and they're just really, really, uh, just they have amazing success right now. They also outgrew us and they stayed downtown near our ecosystem and that's really what we want is, you know, we want job creation. Um, and, and that's really why we exist. And so when someone leaves us, man, we take their picture, we put it on the wall, we want to celebrate them as if they're West Point grads. And I think that uh, when it happens, it's just such a special thing. That is really awesome. Like, I, I love that. And I'm sure you've got a million stories. Like, that's, yeah, yeah. I love that. Because that's, I love moments of synchronicity and serendipity and when people come together and magic happens just because they were in the same space together. One of the things that struck me early on after Orange opened was, mm, I get it. Synchronicity doesn't make house calls. If you're working at your kitchen table, those things don't happen, but they really do happen when you're in space together with other people. It's, an, it's kind of an amazing thing. Um, this is something that just occurred to me, and I think you might be able to speak to this a bit. Um, I know there are a lot of startups that happen at, at um, co-working spaces and a lot of you know, new endeavors. Um, which leads to a certain impression of what the space must be like and what the people in it are like. But I know you've seen, oh my gosh, I can't imagine how many co-working spaces you've been to. Could you talk about a little bit about just what different kinds of co-working spaces exist and what they're like and what the communities yeah. are like? So um, one of the big trends in co-working right now is a trend towards specialization in, in cities that have matured a little bit in the co-working industry, like in Austin, where you'll have a co-working space like Laura Shook, who's not here today, her co-working space is all about wellness. And, um, and then there's other spaces like Capital Factory down the road is very much uh, for startups and venture-backed um, accelerator type things. And other places like Orange, I guess, is small business and um, freelancers. But there's also uh, in LA, there's lots of things that are like focused on just 3D printing or just augmented reality, or there's a new startup, um, a new co-working space that's all about gaming. So if you're a gaming um, programmer, designer, developer, producer, you join this space. And so there's all different types, um, but generally um, the thing that they all have in common is this sense of everyone belongs, an inclusive type energy and um, it, uh, one thing that I wanted to speak of real quick to Lorenzo, to the audience here that, that may, may not realize, if you're, if you're just a freelancer or you're just a one-man shop or a one-woman shop, one of the benefits of going to a co-working space is the sense of growth, of opportunities that you can feel there. Sometimes it can be intimidating if um, you're a rock star web designer and you've hit your, your plateau because you're like, I've only got so many hours in the day and I can't do anything else. I guess I've maxed out my company. And then you meet people that learned how to start an agency um, by hiring people in the space or programmers partner up with 
designers or eyewear people partner up with, you know, exactly like what you're saying. And so it's really this opportunity for free business consulting on a day-to-day -day basis. And you see people around and you hear these phone calls where people just got off, I just closed a big deal and you're hearing about these things and you're like kind of motivated. I often call it like motivation by um, proximity. And um, that's the thing about co-working spaces. Everything's out in the open, which has its negatives, but it, I think it, it eclipses it with lots of positives. And um, it's just a very growth-centered place to be. And that's why people work there a lot. Because you feel big when you're working at a co-working space, even if your company is small. Because you look next door and you realize that you're just like that person and they may have a lot larger company. So you ask them, well, how do I get from point A to point B? Oh, well, this is how I did it. Here, let me introduce you to this person. Oh, and hey, do you need an article in the Statesman? Let me introduce you to this person. And so just being around that is an opportunity for that growth. That's awesome, and that's so true. And I love the way you put that. It is an opportunity for growth just being around other people. And I know one of the cool things, too, that we haven't really talked about yet, that one of the things that I know happens at our space, and I'm imagining happens at yours, too, um, is things like, like Dean has found a lot of resources at Orange just from being there and people to hire and work with. And I keep looking at Dawn Weathersby here in the front row because they've... Because she's... <laughs> awesome and helped Dean with his branding and style guide when he needed help with that and it you know before yeah. I even had one and, and I yeah. knew I needed one but how do I create one right. right you can't just hire a any old designer because that kind of a, a, a thing is kind of unusual and it's usually for big bigger businesses we're getting that way but it's not something that um, that I could ask most people but that's an unusual trait that one of the amazing things about about orange at least uh that i can speak to is the you, the, the the amount of talent that's there that has all kinds of unique experiences and knowledge is amazing well and and i know we keep saying the word orange a lot because that's where i'm from and that's where he's a member but i will tell you Whatever co-working space is near you, there is magic that happens when independent humans come together in space. So we keep saying the word orange, but take that to mean co-working in general. Like even the folks that I've met in the co-working world and Lorenzo and all of the spaces, like magic happens when we all come together in space. Um, but also, in addition to the resources you've found, like all of our members bring themselves. So it's as much as you get from it, there's opportunities to give to it, which can also be super reassuring if you're at a stage in your business where you're like facing lots of growth. Sometimes that can be challenging. And it's nice to be reminded that you're good at something and an expert in something. Because like Dean, in his life before the sunglasses company, had a whole nother career. Plural. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was, a long time ago, I was Road and Track Magazine staff photographer. Uh, after that, I started a production company. We did uh, car commercials primarily for national ad campaigns for, for the manufacturers. Um, and after that, I started a stock photo agency. Um, but what's nice is I have a ton of, and I'm also a pilot, I fly airplanes. Um, and all of this knowledge uh, is, you know, filed away in this head. And it, the, the, the group of people that are at co-working spaces is is such that we we talk to each other regularly and and you know I don't tell people my background entirely but it, sometimes it comes out and somebody will ask me about you know the automotive industry or because there's they've got a startup in that area and I have a lot of experience and knowledge in that and I'm happy to just offer my uh, you know ad, not even necessarily advice but just my experience in that world and uh, sometimes it's helpful not just to get uh, um, to get a contact or, or you know, more information, but just as a, even as a peer, just to talk about what they're working on, not even for answers, but just a sounding board even sometimes, and it makes a huge difference. It's uh, it's been really really helpful uh, on on in both in in, in both ends uh, of that uh, of that. Totally. Well, and 
One little, one little story. Can I tell a story? Okay. One of my favorite moments, because this was crazy, was we had uh, a couple of guys working on a hardware startup. Is anybody out there in a product company? Nice. I love it. I have great respect for product companies because I see it's a challenging thing. It's a different kettle of fish. So yay. Um, but we had a couple of guys who were working on um, a highly engineered. Um, product and they were trying to decide what manufacturing company to use. They've never done this before, they're first time hardware manufacturing folks and that's a huge decision. Like they've got one little pile of money and they can make one choice and if that prototype doesn't work, that might be the death of their company. So high stakes decision. And they're sitting there at a table having this intense discussion about should we go with this firm or this firm? And one of our other members goes, kind of schlumping by to go get a cup of coffee because he's kind of bleary-eyed and mourning. But he heard what they were talking about. And he stops by and he's like, what are you guys working on? And they're like, like, dude, we're having a conversation here. But they're polite because that's what we do. And they explained what they were working on. And he's like, huh, you know, I've got an uncle in Japan who's been a broker for high-end device manufacturing for like 30 years. Would it help to talk to him? I could probably get him on Skype. And they're like, sure. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> and it was, and the thing that struck me in that moment was, you would not go on LinkedIn or on Facebook to say, hey, is there an SEO expert? Because that's what that guy does. Is there an SEO expert in Austin who's got an uncle in Japan who's an expert on high-end device manufacturing that we could pick his brain? Or like, in a coffee shop? Right. Like, it's just not going to happen. But at a co-working space, it does. And those are the kinds of intersections and collisions that can make such a huge material difference in your business. Like, instead of spending three days Googling something or trying to second-guess if you're making the right choice... It's shocking how often someone just shows up with exactly the right piece of knowledge that you need to take that next step. So that's, I love that. And I know you've done that for people and I imagine like when you were spending every day in conjuncture, you did that for people and I'm sure you've done it for people. Like that's, that's what we I do. Because I mean really we like seeing other people uh, succeed at, their, at whatever it is they're working on. It's, it's really exciting. And, and if we can help in some tiny little way of just ideas or just a sounding board or anything, it's awesome. We love seeing it. So I'm curious, do we want to see if people have questions? I, I'm actually, I'm not entirely sure how much time we've got left. I don't actually have a watch on. Do we have a few minutes for questions and discussion? Groovy, we've got lots of time. So I'm curious if anyone has questions or thoughts or if you have opinions about co-working or if there's anything that you'd like to hear about. Oh, like to start a co-working space? Cool, are you thinking about starting one? Yay. I yeah. love it. Brains. The, the, the question was uh, yeah. how, to, how to start a co-working space, uh, what to do, um, get a space, etc. Let me preface the answer by um, uh, explaining that co-working started before co-working spaces. Um, here in Austin, there was a, a group called Jelly, and we met uh, once a week at a coffee shop. And then it got to the point where it started with a few people to the point where it was 40, 50, 60 people showing up at the coffee shop wanting to work. So essentially, it's just being around community, being around people. And then once you have the people, then you find the space. And so a lot of people, there's two ways to start a co-working space. One is you find the community first, and then you find the space that fits that community. And, and then you start the membership process and, and build it out, design it. Decide on what your budget is. Do you want it to be fancy, a multi-million dollar space? Or do you want it to be more like, well, we're going to utilize what we've got and, and do little things here and there. But it all depends on how, how grandiose you want it to be. But co-working is now an industry. And, you know, um, a lot of people here are familiar with WeWork. It's right down the street. WeWork is a $20 billion company. They are one of the largest companies in the world. And it's 
It's confusing, it's exciting, and it's new. Let's keep in mind, YouTube is only 10 years old, um, and YouTube is the way we do video now. You know, co-working is becoming the way we do officing. And so the industry is still new, and so if you do want to get into it, um, you know, just, uh, just start talking to other co-working space owners. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, and Geekdom started with someone who had an idea for there needed to be this community and this activity. Yeah, I think, um, I think philosophically I would, I would offer two things. I think in the co-working world, there's different categories. You know, David talked about this, I think, very well. I think that there's, there's the original version of co-working, which can tend, you know, uh, sometimes to be like a library, very quiet. I think that one of the things that we are all involved in is the category of collaborative co-working. And I think collaborative co-working is, the, is my favorite category because it, it just means people talk to each other and it's part of the gig and it's part of the vibe. And I think that once you decide if you're in the collaborative co-working category, I think that you need to ask, what is our mission? Because I think that the mission really dictates the tactics. You know, our mission is to create an ecosystem and so we are very heavily funded by a guy who wants to get that mission. Our, our mission is to not own any percentage of the companies or to own 2% of the next Facebook. So our tactics are very different. And I think that everything that we do reinforces and points to the mission, who we partner with. Um, and I think that if you pick a niche and say, you know, I just want to support artists or if I want to be in, you know, green energy, it, it's a whole other different mission and it allows you to say uh, yes and no to things. And I think that's part of the, the struggle with co-working is that you need to decide what you're prepared to say no to. Uh, because when you start building a community, there's magic there. And when people see magic, they're going to want to make you change two degrees this way or this way to fit their mission. And I think that you should compare everything to your mission and, and say yes or no compared to that. So just a, just a high-level thought. That's a great point. Thank you. I, and I think you're totally right. Like, there are so many different flavors and styles of co-working. And yeah, having the mission first and like, what do you want to accomplish? Because some co-working spaces are, honestly, it's about the real estate. It's about flexible short-term office lease. And that's it. And you may or may not meet other people there. And then there's collaborative co-working where everybody comes together and it's like, who are you serving and what do you want to bring them? And that really does dictate absolutely everything. Like, it's funny, like I didn't think about that, but you're right, mission is everything. I only know that the hard way because I did it wrong for a while. So I, you know, so to, you know, everything you shouldn't do is the book I'll write on co-working. But you really learned it. But I learned it, yes, yes. After, and actually, and it's the community that pointed it out, right? The community comes to you and says, dude, you're totally screwing this up. And, uh, and then you have to course correct. I wanted to add one thing, just, just in case there's people out there that are going to go start a co-working space and, and may not think it all the way through. Um, pragmatically, it's important to do a feasibility assessment and know how much it's going to cost, know how much you're going to make, know when you're going to break even, know that certain membership prices need to be a certain way. Are you going to be focused on private offices? Or are you going to be on open? And, and so it's one thing, and it feels very nice and warm and fuzzy to say co-working is all about community. But at the end of the day, for the person who's investing the money into it, there needs to be a return, and you need to be able to pay your bills because no co-working space is successful to its community if it can't survive. And, uh, and so those are the very pragmatic realities of co-working nowadays. And in order to design a co-working space that is competitive, it has to be a little fancier than the co-working spaces of yesteryear because there's so many out there. And, um, and so that's, that's something to keep in mind, too. Yeah, very good point. Yeah, and wholeheartedly I wholeheartedly agree with David. Yeah, totally. Yeah, like I know there are stories from the early days of co-working where people were like, we don't care, we'll sit on a cardboard box. As long as you've got internet and people around, we're good. And now the expectations are different depending on your community. Right. And I know, and you work with people to help them figure that out, right? Yeah, yeah. which is which is awesome. <laughs> um, cool. Does that help? Awesome. And yes, there are lots of wonderful co-working space owners in Austin. It's a wonderful group of humans. Talk to me. We're good. Um, any other questions? What have we got? I just wondered, is it an open door policy or kind of a closed door policy? Like, if I've never heard of this, and it's so fantastic. So, like, how would one inquire or come for a visit, or is there an online... There's a seeker handshake, and... <laughs> 
supposed to be a surprise. It's a, it's a decoder ring. That's yes, really what it's it is. a secret decoder ring. Some are very exclusive, but for the most part, most are inclusive. And generally, you can just show up and get a tour, and then um, and then most places do free first day of co-working on the day you get your tour, and then you see what membership options there are. Most times you can join, I just want to show up once a month, I just want to use meeting rooms, I want to show up every day, and they have pricing that matches those. Yeah, and we do, um, I have a map that I curate a Google map of all the co-working spaces in Austin. So if anybody wants that, you can contact me and I can email you that map. Happy to share it. Um, and like David said, most places, co-working is a very friendly environment. So most spaces, you, sometimes you can reach out by email and find out what their policy is. But most spaces, you can even just drop by and say hi. Yeah, and they're all on Yelp, so you can yeah. just look them up on Yelp. Exactly. Any other questions? What have we got? Anybody? Well, I love that right here in the front row, I'm just gonna give them a shout out because we've got some orange folks here in the front row. You know, I wanted to add a comment to what, yeah, what totally. we were talking about earlier um, and having, you know, the, uh, one of the reasons to go there is people, people buy and trade services. I, I liken it to every co-working space has its own GDP. I mean, there's so much, there's so much buying and selling going back and forth. But I think that the big thing, this is really, uh, uh, what, what I appreciate about co-working is that I think that if you're an entrepreneur, the world is really not, the, the world is really hard for you because nobody, no, most parents right now are not telling their kids, go to school, get good grades, go to college, and then be an entrepreneur, right? That's, that's just not the way it works. And so if you've chosen the path, it's just harder for you. And I think that a lot of co-working is kind of like the support group where there is fear, there is risk, there is anxiety about, oh my God, you know, only an entrepreneur knows the holy crap, am I gonna make payroll, right, anxiety. And I think that, you know, that's, to me, co-working is really the, the, the epicenter of where people go to get that emotional support because being an entrepreneur is so hard. If you've decided to be an entrepreneur, right, the, the world has not been structured to make it easy for you. And I think that co-working is probably the next, the, the closest thing you're gonna get to a support group just for the people that understand like, hey man, I have to fire my first person. Do you have a template or you wanna do it for me, please? Can I pay <laughs> you to have a drink? Me? That's right. <laughs> and, and so I think that, you know, co-working to me is very helpful for entrepreneurs when they don't know what to do or they need support because people are not gonna understand their problem set. I, and I, I hold that question really quick. I wanna add to that. Um, and this may stray a little bit away from co-working and more towards entrepreneurism is there is sometimes it seems to be a common perception and I think it's a misperception that that an entrepreneur has to come up with all of the ideas all by themselves and it's has to be all their ideas or it's not a real comp it's not their company preach and 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 that couldn't be further from the truth when I whether I hire employees or I hire freelancers to help me with my company I'm actually uh, looking for people that are way smarter than me in those fields way smarter than me. And that makes me look good. I don't actually have to come up with all those ideas. I don't have the bandwidth. I don't, I'm not that smart to, to, to be able to be the most creative creative or the most creative designer or the best bookkeeper or the best uh, uh, eyewear designer or, or the best marketer or the best, you know, all of these things. I can't do it all. I'm not that smart. I don't know all those things. But I do know that I can find all of those people near me, since I work at Orange or at a co-working space, and it makes my life so much easier. Um, I can I can then focus on the things that I think I do need to work on, and because um, I have a team of people that help me grow this business. I love that you brought that up. Um, we are getting the the yellow light now, so I do want. Do you have any final thoughts, or should we take one more question? I think we've got time for either. You're awesome.
for some reason they feel the need to have an interaction with other community members. Yeah. Repeat the question. I am totally going to paraphrase what you just said. I feel like I should have jumped down and handed you the mic because that was beautifully put. She was saying that she was under the impression that co-working was a place you know, for people to have an office, but that she's realized maybe it's a deliberate community and that the people there could work at home, but have a need or choose to come together in community, which is so true. Every single person at a co-working space could be sitting at Starbucks or at any coffee shop or sitting at their kitchen table, but the benefits of being in space with other people, your business grows faster and you... Mm -mm. It's not about the desk. It's That's an interesting point. She asked if um, you're choosing a co-working space by the community of people that you would want to interact with. And actually, kind of. Sometimes it is. If you live in a neighborhood where there's six co-working spaces within an easy drive of you, check them all out. See who you get along with best. Or go to a focused co-working space. Um, but I will say there is vast benefit to being in space with other entrepreneurs and independent folks, no matter what you think that community is like when you first meet them. Because everybody brings their whole self to a co-working space. So like our SEO guy who happened to know a guy in Japan who brokers device manufacturing, you don't know what other people know and when you'll need it. And it just, it shows up. You show up and synchronicity shows up. Or what other people need. Right. And the other, and like, you know, I have all my skills and background in history, but I'm not gonna blurt that out at all times. This is, this is my background, this is what I've done. But when it comes up, I can go, hey, you know, I had a little, little experience with that a long time ago. And it's sometimes helpful. Right. Having yeah. the opportunity to share of yourself, too, yeah. is a really cool thing. I also think from a practical standpoint, too, it, in terms of lead generation for a business, you know, uh, the co-working space, so Shelly will get asked, do you know anybody that does web design or graphic design? And uh, a lot of people, so that's one way for businesses to get leads is to be known. But I think a lot of times uh, community members knowing each other will start referring each other. And so, you know, you can grow your business by just putting it out there and knowing people, you know, having people know what you do, because someone inevitably is going to say, I need that service, or I know someone that needs that service. But that doesn't happen if you're just, you know, typing away. Yeah, and we are getting the red light now, so I'm, that is apparently our time. Um, but I know I'll be around for a little while after, and I'm sure you guys might be around for a little while after, and I think there's a networking break right after this. Thank you all so much for Thank being you. part of this conversation. Thank you. And thank you guys thank for you. coming out. Yeah. This was fun. Thank you. Yeah.